Eleven Elms. And the winner of this year's Man Booker Prize is... The theatricality of the pause was rewarded with the quietness it had anticipated. Not exactly a total silence. A table of small publishers near the back of the room, new to the occasion and having drained their allocation of complimentary wine before the meal, were slower than most to stop talking. Then from a distant kitchen came the sound of a large metal bowl landing upside down on a tiled floor. The quickening lasso of its siren echoing against stainless steel cupboards and ceramic surfaces before it spiralled to a halt. For most of the evening, the cavernous subterranean ballroom of the hotel had vibrated and cannoned with literary gossip, the popping of corks and the scrape of cutlery against crockery. Even as a background drone, it had continued as the six shortlist of books were eulogised in gushing adjectives and hyperbolic adverbs until every contender seemed not just a likely winner, but a document to rival any of the great works of the language throughout history. Now, though, the room was hushed and expectant. Of this year's Man Booker Prize repeated Eliza Callahan, eminent historian, occasional presenter of weighty television documentaries and chair of the judges, buying herself a few seconds to relocate her place in her speech and to memorise the correct wording, is Eleven Elms by Jeb. She didn't need to announce his surname because the volcano of applause had already erupted. Jeb Foster... Eleven Elms by Jeb Foster, she barked into the microphone, making the PA system buzz with distortion. Out of the dozen people constellated around table number four, Jeb Foster was the last to rise. The other guests were already on their feet, wanted to embrace him or shake his hand, though as he finally disentangled himself from the scrum of adulation, it was a somewhat slow and pensive-looking figure that passed through the channel of photographers and made his way up to the stage and towards the podium. The beam of a spotlight moved slightly ahead of him all the way, as if expecting a more excited and enthusiastic victor. There was more clapping and cheering, punctuated by shouts of Bravo! Bravo! and one piercing wolf whistle which could only have been ironic, judging by the laughter that followed. Jeb took his glasses from the breast pocket of his dinner jacket and from the inside pocket produced a small notebook. Once the ovation had subsided, but without looking up, he said, I'm not going to pretend I haven't written a speech, or that it's a short one. He held the notebook aloft and flipped through the pages, all of them crammed with handwriting, a gesture that drew more amusement from the room. Though none of it in the form of gratitude or thanks, said Jeb, in the same monotone, a comment that elicited further laughter, but underscored by a tone of nervousness. The party standing in a circle around table four shared a series of hollow giggles and uncomfortable smiles and retook their seats. Jeb turned to the first page and began reading. Three years ago, I received a letter from the post-war novelist Dorothea Beckman asking if I would write her biography. Point one, I had never heard of Dorothea Beckman, let alone read a book by her. Point two, I did not see myself as a jobbing ghost writer. And yet, point three, at the age of 45, I was a failed and fading author about to be dropped by his publisher and agent, both of whom are sitting just below me here. Please bring them a bottle of champagne to share with the other nine people on table four, who I don't really know, but whose presence this occasion apparently demands. Again there was laughter, but it was somewhat forced and apprehensive. Laughter in a minor key. In fact, I was not even Jeb Foster. 
Jeb is the nom de plume I gave myself at the outset of what I sometimes laughably describe as a writing career. I suppose I thought it invoked a kind of gunslinging panache that plain old Jonathan Foster couldn't conjure. Though in truth, Jonathan Foster isn't my real name either, just the name given to me by my adopted parents. Of course, anyone who bought a copy of one of my previous books, my memoir, Foster Child, will already know this assuming all 277 purchasers actually read it. Described in a Sunday Times roundup column as mawkish and ill-advised, it did receive three five-star reviews on Amazon, only two of which were written by myself. As Odysseus told the Cyclops, I am nobody, nobody, except in my case it happened to be true. And lastly, point four, as my long-term, by which I mean long-suffering, girlfriend Christina said as I read Dorothea's letter over the kitchen table, what have you got to lose? Like my agent and publisher, Christina was also about to drop me. Did drop me, in fact. And who could have blamed her? It was half past four on a Wednesday afternoon when she made that remark and I was still in my pyjamas. Recently, I have entertained hopes that a book a shortlisting might reawaken Christina's interest in our relationship, but unfortunately for me, she simply isn't that shallow or desperate. Jeb went on. The vague sense of ignorance I felt at knowing nothing about Ms Beckman was transmuted to embarrassment when I opened her Wikipedia entry. Ten novels many of them bestsellers in their day, translated into over a dozen languages, winners of prizes all across the globe, and Dorothea herself the recipient of the Commonwealth Authors Prize and an MBE for services to literature. He cleared his throat and flipped the page. Dorothea Beckman lived alone at Eleven Elms, a dilapidated mansion house set within 50-odd acres of overgrown Northamptonshire parkland. If she had staff to help her, I never saw them. And on our first meeting, she'd walk down to the rotten wooden gates of the estate to greet me and lead me through piles of leaf litter along a potholed drive veined by beech roots to an orangery choked with grapevines and wisteria where she spent most of the summer. In the winter, she sat in a butler's kitchen at the back of the house, hunched over an oil-fired range. At 79, she seemed in reasonably good health. A tallish woman, at least as tall as me, she stooped somewhat, partly through old age and partly, I think, through a lifetime of trying to disguise her height. She was handsome rather than beautiful, in an almost classical or even heroic way. Thick brown hair, which I suppose was dyed. Watery, light blue eyes. Lips always curved into a gentle but regretful smile. In answer to my obvious question about why such an accomplished author should need a ghostwriter, she lifted up her hands to show how her fingers were agonisingly misshapen by arthritis. Anyway, I've lost that sharpness, she said. Lost my edge. And in answer to my second obvious question, why me? She simply replied, you are my first choice. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of my 20 or so visits during the following 12 months, I developed a respect, admiration and sympathy for Dorothea Beckman that I've felt for no other human being in the course of my life. I also admit to being captivated by her stylish and proud appearance. Dorothea exuded the kind of elegance I associate with a bygone age. On every occasion, and I say this as a man standing here in a pre-loved tuxedo and an unironed shirt, she dressed immaculately, never once wearing the same outfit, and always with matching shoes, handbag and jewellery. The one constant accessory 
been a silver and onyx ring on the little finger of her right hand, which had been passed down the family line from her great-grandmother. Sometimes in the stifling heat of the glass house, and sometimes in the fumy confines of the scullery, we'd sit and talk for four or five hours at a time, till she became tired or, on a couple of occasions, drifted off to sleep. The ground rules were clear. I could record all the interviews and I could ask whatever I liked. The limits of our conversation would be bordered only by the perimeters of human decency, as I decided them. If you have read Eleven Elms, my novel, Jeb said, making air quotes with his fingers around the word novel, you will know Dorothea's story already. How as a child she was passed through the window of a train in the middle of the night to escape the greatest atrocity of the 20th century. How she somehow scrounged an existence, then a passage to England, then an Oxford University education to become a much respected novelist and occasional socialite. And how she came to be living out her final years in the faded grandeur of a dilapidated country residence, utterly companionless and alone. And if you have read the reviews, you will know how I painted a portrait in words and did so with the scalpel-sharp eye of McEwen and the aching poignancy of Ishiguru, etc., etc. You will also be aware how Eleven Elms is written in ten chapters, each one carrying the title of one of Dorothea's own novels, from first to last. Once our series of interviews were over, I wrote those chapters in chronological order, sending them to her as and when they were completed. As an indication of her approval, rather than respond with a letter or phone call, she would post me some small and appropriate token of acknowledgement, an iridescent blue feather when she'd received a J in winter, a single blade of grass for the chapter when the field was ours, and so on and so forth. What I didn't tell you in Eleven Elms, said Jeb, halting momentarily. I am about to tell you now, something Dorothea didn't reveal until our final interview, just before the writing process commenced. The missing eleventh chapter, if you like, drafted then erased, a kind of coda designed to back like the entire narrative, but omitted. Maybe it would have brought Eleven Elms even greater success. I'm sure both my agent and editor would have encouraged its inclusion had they got wind of it. But for better or worse, I left it out. Dorothea had walked with me into the grounds of the estate, pointing out the eleven sites where the great elm trees had once stood, now just holes in the earth where the root balls had been burnt out in an effort to eradicate the disease that killed them. I'd made some glib comment about everything coming to an end in its own time, to which she replied, No, life goes on, it must, and I wish I'd said as much to my son. She was sitting down in the fold-up chair I'd carried outside for her, shielding her eyes from the low autumn sun beaming directly across the heath to the south. You had a son, I said. I tried to make it sound like a question born out of friendship and genuine curiosity, but as always, she was one step ahead of me, reading my thoughts, hearing the panic in my voice as I contemplated having to rethink the whole structure of the book, a book I was building around the quiet subtext of childlessness and its inherent sadness. When I was 20, she said, couldn't keep him. Impossible in those days, of course, like most things back then. I had no idea that you were a mother, I said, moved by her sudden disclosure, but rattled by the idea of more research and interviews and investigation. A blackbird was trilling away at the top of a hawthorn bush, poking through a privet hedge, 
a seamless outpouring of ecstasy or alarm. It was hard to say which. Not a mother, a father, she said. Her hand was still in front of her eyes, the arthritic fingers at painful angles to each other, the silver and onyx ring almost liquid in the light. Jeb took a sip of water from the glass on the side of the lectern, next to the champagne flute, overflowing with bubbling froth when it had been thrust at him on the way to the stage, but now just an inch or so of lifeless, pale wine. He'd felt nothing during that melodramatic pause before his name was announced, but now his hand was shaking and his voice quavered when he spoke. Nearly finished, he said, swallowing hard, pushing his glasses back up to the bridge of his nose. Three days after sending Dorothea the complete typescript, I received her acknowledgement. A bonsai tree in a glass case, a miniature Chinese elm, the limbs and leaves lovingly manicured and tended, the tree toy-like and innocent in its size and scale, but the bark clearly ancient in texture and pattern. And so, without any note of explanation, probably because I had no sense of hope, I delivered the book to my agent and resigned myself to the usual lack of response. I'd give it two months, I thought, before begging for a reply. One week later, I got an email from him, something of a rarity in itself, his previous communique having been a Christmas card signed by his secretary that arrived in mid-January and was wrongly addressed to Jonathan Lister. But if the email was a surprise, his response was flabbergasting. Eleven Elms, he said, was unequivocally the best novel he'd read in several years, possibly in his professional life, and he'd wept and wept until his heart was empty. Three days later, I got a phone call from my editor, a woman who hadn't even recognised me when I bumped into her on Paddington Station earlier that year. She said she thought Eleven Elms was an important milestone in 21st century fiction and that they were restructuring their publishing schedule in order to make it eligible for the major prizes. Elated at this reception, but paralysed by the burgeoning misunderstandings and my unwillingness to correct them, I felt as if I was being torn in half. How would I explain to Dorothea that the story of her life, which I had explored and described to the best of my ability and integrity, had been mistaken by both my agent and publisher alike for a work of complete fiction? Two possibilities existed, neither of them at all palatable. One, nobody had any idea who Dorothea Beckman was. Or two, I had completely fucked up the writing. Listeners, I'm sure you weren't anticipating such a long speech tonight, and that your idling Bentleys, Mercedes and horse-drawn carriages are already causing gridlock around the streets of Mayfair, but please indulge me with five more minutes of your time. And please, ladies and gentlemen, believe every word I'm about to tell you, because, to the best of my knowledge, every word is true. I decided to phone Dorothea and broach the situation as gently as possible. I called her number but the phone was answered by the receptionist of a leisure centre in Kettering, who answered several more of my calls that day from both my mobile and landline, explaining with increasing annoyance that she had no knowledge of anywhere called Eleven Elms or anyone called Dorothea Beckman, and unless I wanted to book a squash court or register for a Pilates class, would I please stop ringing. I chose to interpret this gremlin in the telephone system as a kind of reprimand by the gods for not having had the courage to speak to Dorothea face to face. And the next morning, lifted down my old bicycle from the hooks on the garage wall, pumped up the tyres and set off for Northamptonshire. It was a journey of over four hours, 
I wanted to rehearse my conversation with her and reason that cycling rather than driving would clear my head and give me time to think. Infinitely more time, as it turned out. Because for reasons that eluded me then and elude me to this day, I never arrived. After leaving the dual carriageway at the usual exit and pedalling through the nearest village, I somehow lost my way and in pouring rain and a clammy summer mist, Eleven Elms proved impossible to find. Even when I thought I'd located the gates to the drive, they turned out to be old stone pillars incorporated into a modern brick-built wall, beyond which was a gated community of modern townhouses and apartments. After cycling the same distance back home, sodden and exhausted, I wrote the day off as some kind of cerebral aberration and had an early night. But the next morning, bone dry and wide awake, the mystery only deepened. Staring first at an old road atlas and then at an ordnance survey map, there was absolutely no indication of any country house and estate in that region of the country. And zooming in on Google Earth to where I expected to find unkempt paddocks and thick copses only threw up images of parked cars on tarmac streets and lanes. That was just the beginning. The next few days didn't so much pass as unravel. With a growing sense of frustration and incomprehension, which was very rapidly developing into panic, I scurried around looking for some kind of indisputable evidence or incontrovertible proof that might validate my sanity, only to meet with further confusion. Where a row of Dorothea's books had once stood on a shelf in my study, there was now an empty space. Nor did my local library or local bookshop or any websites have any record of her work or indeed any work by an author of that name. A Wikipedia page had disappeared. An internet search for Dorothea Beckman threw up thousands of people by the same name, but none of them my Dorothea, all of them false trails and dead ends. Three further trips to Northamptonshire by car left me staring at the same housing development through shiny, electrically operated wrought iron gates. The day that bafflement and stupefaction turned to terror was the day I sat down and played through the many hours of interviews recorded in the orangery and the scullery of Eleven Elms. Turned up to full volume, every tape hissed and crackled with a horrible, horrible emptiness. Tormented by ideas of madness and paranoia, but intoxicated by notions of success as the book went through all its editorial processes, I became a divided spirit. For the best part of a year, by which I mean the worst part of a year, and with absolutely no verification other than my own questionable memories to say that Dorothea Beckman had ever existed, I stayed in the house, still in my pyjamas at four in the afternoon again, a stranger to the written word and a stranger to myself. One more thing, if you will allow me. On the day the published book was delivered to my door, the courier unloaded another item from the back of the van, wrapped in brown paper, about the size of a small cupboard and similarly light or hollow feeling. Inside was a doll's house, beautifully crafted, exquisite in its modelling. And I will not have to tell you that in its style and features, it was a precise replica of a certain Northamptonshire country house I'd visited, or believed I'd visited on so many occasions. Like all such doll's houses, the front aspect of the structure opened outwards and the roof tilted backwards on a hinge. Peering into the tiny rooms to examine the detailed furnishings and meticulous decorations, my eye travelled to the one human figure in the dwelling, a tall, slim woman, impeccably dressed in a matching skirt and jacket, with matching handbag and shoes, 
standing in the attic nursery, next to an empty crib, her arms reaching out towards me. How am I to silence be measured? Because a pure and profound silence now existed in the sunken ballroom of that great hotel, a noiselessness of high magnitude and deep intensity. Every face at every table was turned towards Jeb, remote and spotlit in the centre of the stage, head down, staring into his notebook. Even the waiters and waitresses stood motionless between the tables, and in a doorway under the rear alcove, kitchen staff in their striped aprons and white tunics were leaning and listening. I am ghostwriter to a ghost, said Jeb, and a bewildered son and a troubled soul, and a most haunted man. It wasn't clear if Jeb had come to the end of his speech or intended to carry on. The room had become a painting or photograph, a fixed, unaltered moment, and stayed that way for several seconds more, until Eliza Callahan, standing in Jeb's shadow all this while, leaned into the microphone and said, And like Odysseus, Cunning and wily to the last, Jeb Foster, ladies and gentlemen, this year's Man Booker winner and storyteller extraordinaire. This time the response was a tumult, a roaring torrent of applause that washed Jeb from the stage, carried him bodily down the rapids of the stairs and propelled him out into the widening delta of the room, handshakes and backslaps reaching in from all sides, Compliments lobbed in his direction as he floated past. Genius, pure genius, said his agent. Bloody brilliant, you cheeky bastard, he heard his editor say. He was hurried towards an empty cloakroom, described as a green room by one of the stewards, where he could catch his breath before being paraded in front of the print media, then escorted to Broadcasting House for a live interview with Radio 4. Coats, bags and umbrellas hung from pegs on three of the walls of the room, above piles of rucksacks and briefcases. The upper half of the other wall being a large single mirror surrounded by unshaded light bulbs. Below the mirror was a long table or work surface, empty apart from a small gift-wrapped box about two inches square, tied with a satin ribbon. Even before he opened the package and then opened the small velvet case within it and slipped the silver and onyx ring onto his little finger, Jeb knew what it was. He knew what it was and who it was from and what it meant. What he didn't know and what he would never find out was how. A most haunted man, he said out loud, looking directly into his own eyes in the polished mirror holding the ring next to his face. There was a knock on the door. Everyone is waiting for you, Mr Foster. Whenever you're ready, 